have you have you heard of the four burners theory, Chase? No. So the gosh. So the, <laughs> enlighten me. I love it when I hear something new. Let's go. So the four burners theory states that there's four burners in your life. There's family, business, or, or work, friends, and health. And in order to excel at any one of those things, you have to turn at least one burner off. If you want to be really good at something, you have to turn, turn two of those burners off. And if you're Elon Musk, you're probably turning off three burners and your work burner is going up full blast. The point of that is, is you can't have it all, right? You have to make sacrifices in order to uh, in order to excel in one area. So for us, uh, initially when we started our business, I, I didn't realize this at the time, uh, but I had turned off the friends and the health burner. I wasn't seeing my friends and I was eating really horribly like fast food. And that's what allowed our business to excel. And so later on, you know, I inadvertently turned down the family burner also just to pursue the work burner. And Becoming a family first entrepreneur is all about just kind of balancing those burners, understanding what the priorities are, and then adjusting things accordingly, knowing that you can't have everything going on all at once. Steve, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. So happy to be here, Chase. I am very happy to have been introduced to you not too long ago and I'm familiar with your podcast, very successful podcast, but you got a new work out in the form of a book. An interesting package for a podcast guy, but I know you are um, eager to to share with our audience. And this topic today is very spot on. Uh, as you know, our audience identifies as creators, as entrepreneurs, builders of things, uh, creative curious. And your recent work is called The Family First Entrepreneur, which uh, if we've had a resounding question over the 13 year history of this show it's how do i make it work how do i make my ambitions at work the other things that are important in my life my health my family how do i do all of this at a degree that makes me happy and fulfilled so today's topic is uh, one that i'm eager to dive into but before we do can you just orient us uh how do you describe yourself put yourself in time and place so that uh, we understand a little bit more about you, those folks who might not be familiar with your work. Yeah, I'll just give you guys the 60 second bio here. So I used to be an engineering director in charge of microprocessor design, a pretty demanding job here in the Silicon Valley. And my wife was, uh, she worked uh, as a financial analyst in a Fortune 500 company. And pretty much where we live in the Silicon Valley, you pretty much need two incomes in order to get a good house and a good school district. So when she became pregnant with our first child, she was like, I want to quit. And I was like, I'm cool with that because I didn't get a chance to see my parents as much as I would have liked growing up. The only problem is that I actually flipped out when she told me that too. I was on board, but I flipped out. <laughs> Quietly flipping out inside. Because <laughs> I was like, well, how are we going to make up her, her six-figure salary? And what ended up happening is we launched an online store selling handkerchiefs online. And the quick backstory behind that was when we got married – my wife cries. I mean, tear, tears of joy is in this, in this case. And she knew she was going to cry at the wedding. And she, we spent a lot of money on photography. And she didn't want to be seen in the photos drying her tears with these ratty tissues. So we looked all over the place for handkerchiefs. Couldn't find anywhere them anywhere in the US. Finally, we found this factory in China, but we had to buy a bunch. So we bought a couple hundred, used maybe a handful of them, and then sold the rest on eBay. And they sold like hotcakes. So that's why, you know, uh -huh. fast forward, we decided to launch that store. Then my friends who are engineers started going, hey, Steve, uh, I want to quit. Uh, how did you guys do it? And so I just started documenting the entire journey on a blog over at mywifequitterjob.com. None of my friends read it, but uh, random people started reading <laughs> it. And then that turned into a popular publication, which turned to a podcast, which turned to a YouTube channel, uh, an annual e-commerce conference and a bunch of training classes. Wow. Mywifequitherjob.com is, it's a brilliant read for what it's worth. But why, as you said, none of your friends read it. What, what's the get up there? Just because of the title of the book or, or title of the blog? Or, I mean, it's rich with uh, information on how to actually get out of one career and become an entrepreneur. You know, what was the, the disconnect? I think, you know, when you have friends, they're just trying to be nice and they're like, oh, yeah, how'd you do that? 
they don't really mean it. Um, this is why, you know, when I solicit feedback from like a new website design, I don't ask my friends anymore because they're, 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 they're your friends, right? They don't want you to feel bad. So they're going to tell you what you want to hear. Well said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's get to the fundamentals yeah. though, right? So you're, the goal of, well, I guess this work that you've just put out in the world in the form of a book and the backstory they're in is really about creating time and space for the things that you love. Correct. So how does someone identify that they're, you know, I think there's this, you know, we get all this input, all this feedback, if you will, you, you talked about not soliciting feedback from <laughs> your friends, but we get all this input rather from people in our lives about what we ought to be doing. And, you know, career counselors, parents, friends, relatives, they're all saying whether you should, you know, pursue your passion or, you know, how much time you should spend with your family or all these, we get all these conflicting bits of information. So it seems clear to me that, you know, you've got a process in your book, which we'll talk about and you document there, you know, at my wife quit, quit her job, but how do you get quiet enough to listen to your intuition, to listen to the things that tell you what you actually want to do? Do you really want to be an entrepreneur? Do you really want to set a ceiling for how much money you need to make or how much time you're going to spend at work? Like what's, what is that part of the process? What was it like for you and what do you recommend? I mean, those are really hard questions to answer. Uh, I know for myself, we had a goal for the business and it clearly didn't matter what we sell because we're selling handkerchiefs and I don't really care so much about handkerchiefs, but our why was so that we could spend more time with the kids. And if you're not used to making money online or just having a sudden windfall of money, what you'll find, or I should just speak for myself, not most people, is that you get this fever where you see the money coming in, you just want to make more of it. Right. And that's what ended up happening with us. We started, we made hundred K in our first year and then it was like growing double, double and triple digits every single year. And it got to the point where I was like, okay, next year's goal is 30% higher. And then we'd hit that goal and we'd celebrate for like a day. And then I'd set an even higher goal. And then finally what ended up happening was we, we were making way more than we were spending and I was driving my wife crazy. So finally she actually just broke down. Uh, real tears this time, not not tears of joy like at our wedding. <laughs> and she's like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, what's the point? We're, we're making all this money. We don't even spend like even a quarter of it. What's the point? And that's when I realized that I kind of lost track of the why with our business. And uh, have you have you heard of the four burners theory, Chase? No. So the gosh, so the, <laughs> enlighten me. I love it when I hear something new. Let's go. So the four burners theory states that there's four burners in your life. There's family, business, or, or work, friends, and health. And in order to excel at any one of those things, you have to turn at least one burner off. And if you wanna be really good at something, you have to turn, turn two of those burners off. And if you're Elon Musk, you're probably turning off three burners and your work burner is going up full blast. The point of that is, is you can't have it all, right? You have to make sacrifices in order to uh, in order to excel in one area. So for us, uh, initially when we started our business, I, I didn't realize this at the time, uh, but I had turned off the friends and the health burner. I wasn't seeing my friends and I was eating really horribly like fast food. And that's what allowed our business to excel. And so later on, you know, I inadvertently turned down the family burner also just to pursue the work burner. And Becoming a family first entrepreneur is all about just kind of balancing those burners, understanding what the priorities are, and then adjusting things accordingly, knowing that you can't have everything going on all at once. I, I'm going to try and put myself in the shoes of a listener. Okay. You've got my attention, right? I want to be successful at work and I'm turning down these other areas of my life. But I'm trying to reconcile this. How much is enough? You know, we have our mutual friend, Ramit Sethi. Yep talks about how to live his rich life. And, you know, he articulates a point of view that I have experienced in my life, both personally and professionally with respect to money, which unless you define how much is enough, you really, it's just more is the answer. And I think this is maybe a, a US 
more predominantly a U.S. viewpoint, but just the answer seems to always be more. Yep. So, you know, how, how when you recognize that you just kept setting higher goals, this, you know, this plugs into the point that I'm trying to make here. But how do you, you know, there's someone listening right now sitting in traffic or on the walking path that's going like, okay, been there, you've got my attention, but give me some guidance on how to do that. Yeah, so this is what we did. We found out how much we were spending on a yearly basis. We just doubled that. And then we went from there and treated everything else like gravy. I think the harder answer to that question is how you deal with your ego, right? Like for me, it's, it's hard to turn down the spigot because I know that if I'm turning down the spigot, I'm kind of losing out on potential. Here's just a story. So I went to Stanford University and I was a member of this group called the Mayfield Fellows Program. It's this program. They take 12 students every year and you go and you basically work in like a VC firm. And the goal is they're trying to curate you and to, to start like the next billion dollar company. And we have these. So is this the, was this with the Mayfield Venture? It, it was, yes. Okay. I know those guys. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what ends up happening is we have these retreats every single year and we always share what we're up to. And my peers there are like, oh, yeah, we just had a $400 million exit. I just had a billion dollar exit. Just to give you an idea, Kevin Systrom is a member of this group. He started Instagram. And then whenever it's my turn, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm still selling handkerchiefs online. And I always feel like really embarrassed to tell people what I'm up to, right? So for me, the biggest problem with what you're saying of enough was really dealing with my ego. So here's what I do today. Uh, when my wife broke down that one time, we just stopped all the revenue goals. Like that's not the point of the business, right? The point is, t is time. And to mm -hmm. fill my ego, I just work on one project every single year and I do my best. I don't, I ignore the money part of it. And as long as I'm learning something, I'm happy. So this year is the year of my book. I learned a ton about the book industry. Some things that I didn't even want to know about. Uh, <laughs> last right. year, <laughs> last year was the year YouTube and I grew a channel to over 200K subs. The year before that was TikTok. You know, I took a lot of dance and lip sync lessons and, and got that channel up to 100K. A uh, year before that, it was like uh, different forms of advertising. Like I learned how to run Facebook ads, um, you know, and that sort of thing. So every single year I have a project where I just go all out on it. Whatever happens, happens. Interesting. So let's like, let's map this sort of, um, this mind map that we've got right now onto the system that you really start to talk about in your book. First of all, when did you know that you had a book from, this is the sort of the creator side of folks out there, myself included. Uh, I've shared at length with our listeners that I'm in the middle of uh, another book and I'm always fascinated. So when did you realize that it was a combination of, I've got this unique sort of formula. I've been, running this store I've got this successful blog at my wife quit her job like how did you realize that you had something worth packaging and then i want to dive into you know your the, the system that you yep. you have developed to help people make these decisions so i always knew i had something uh the the real question was whether i could produce a book uh, it's always been a bucket list of mine and I don't know where this dream came from, but I always dreamed about taking my kids to the bookstore, showing my kids the book, and they're going, oh, dad, you're so great. Uh, I, I just did that the other day, actually. I didn't get the, oh, you're so great. They were like, okay, let's just get this photo over with. <laughs> no, I think they're proud just to be joking. Uh, well, who's more proud, actually, is my mom, who who never read any of my blog posts, never watched any of my YouTube videos, never listened to any podcasts. But when I told her I was doing a traditionally published book, she flipped out because she actually understood what I was doing for a change. Yeah. It's weird how it, and it's, a, it is a tidy package, right? It gets you into places to share your work in a way that you might not otherwise penetrate. The internet does that to one extent and sort of, I feel like books and other media films are, you know, they're tidy little packages in other media and you kind of building all of that is, has been fascinating to me, the podcast is a great, you know, exercise and creativity and learning. It's basically learning in real time. What what folks, you know, my goal with this is to help people learn alongside my learning in talking to you, for example. 
so you've you 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 realize that hey this would be a good book package and I can get some additional credibility. My mom now thinks now she knows at least knows what I do. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, let's let's go to the problem. Sure, because the the problem, you know, as I understand it, is that most entrepreneurs, right? They start this business. The, again, the book is called "The Family First Entrepreneur." So most entrepreneurs that I know, they start a business. They start that business because they want freedom their boss is a jerk or they work too much for the man or they the hours aren't aligned with their you know their personal biorhythms or there's a hundred thousand reasons yep. that people ultimately they want freedom and the irony right the par the the paradox which you start off early on in the book is that you end up in a prison. You know, there's that internet meme as a TikToker, you know this, right? I, you know, I used to work 50 hours a week. And so I started my own job and now I work 24 seven. Like that's a, you know, a, a trending real audio. And it's not even a joke. It's real. Most people end up in this prison of their own making with 80 to 100 plus hour work weeks. And the irony is that they have way less time and they are way more isolated because they're not even going to the office. They're sitting at home in a sweaty den, you know, with their headphones on cranking away. So help, you know, how should people reconcile this problem? You know, what? ironically, and I get a lot of emails about this, people wanting to start the business and make money. I think starting the business and making sales is probably the easier part. Getting it to run smoothly is always the harder part. And I think the mindset that you have to have is you have to be efficient with your time. Let me give you some examples here. Like if you look at my, uh, my properties, I'm actually not really on social media that much, unless you consider YouTube social media. Uh, let's take Instagram, for example. My friends who do Instagram well, they're posting seven times a day. My friends who do Facebook well, they're posting 21 times a day. And when they stop posting, the traffic goes away. This is why I don't like social media. So instead, what I do is I focus on longer term traffic strategies like SEO and YouTube. I have posts that I wrote 10 years ago that still generate me a ton of traffic today. I have videos that I published three years ago that still generate a ton of views for me today. And so one thing that you need to worry about, one, one thing that you should be concerned with is leveraging your time as ma in in as in a in a large largest way as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maximizing the leverage, right? Yeah. Um, the I other, feel like, yeah. Sorry, just a quick question there, because I I want to please do not lose track of where you are, because I realize this is going to be a little bit of a departure. I need to put a pin in in that. So, because this is a, it's not a an innocuous phrase. Like when you say, "I hate social media." Or maybe maybe you said I don't like social media. Yeah. I'm gonna put my own stamp yeah, on yeah, it. Like, no problem. Yeah, yeah, it, it. I used to really enjoy the process of communicating with others and storytelling, and yet I know I would say dozens of people who make hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars using ex almost exclusively social media, and I do not know a single person who loves it. It is a hamster wheel. And so the strategy that you're talking about, again, the larger context is how to run a business, how to run a life that you love concurrently, and you're talking about maximizing your time. So right now I'm going to put myself in the mind of a listener who's in the exact same place that you were, say, three or four years ago trying to figure this out and is going to say, wait a minute, the only place I really get leads or the only place I, you know, I can communicate with my customers or whatnot is Instagram because I have a visual business or because I have blah, blah, blah. So how do you reconcile the fact that you're, you is, are there more than one methodology? Is there more than one methodology to constrain the amount of effort that you put in to maximize the, you know, the results as you've done with long-term long tail SEO, for example, because right now someone is just saying, yeah, I'd love to do that, Steve. I also 
don't like how much how social media makes me feel but i also it's a great way for me to connect with my audience so let's go one one yeah. click deeper on the social sure. media bit i believe that any medium can be tailored to your business like just tell me one business where youtube and social and seo won't work and i'll give you a counter example i mean let's say you sell handkerchiefs you might think that yes. there's not that much search volume and maybe there isn't, but what you're trying to, so we sell handkerchiefs for weddings just for context. Yeah. Now there might not be that many people searching for handkerchiefs, but there are a lot of people getting married. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to attract the type of people who would buy your products, not necessarily put out content about your products. Right. Um, mm -hmm. If you choose to do one more. thing, just focus yeah. on it. Got it. Right? Keep going. Give us this example. So if you're like, I sell wedding I, I sell handkerchiefs for weddings. There's not that many people searching for handkerchiefs, but there are a lot of people getting married. So let's attract those people. So what kind of... Let's so I'll give you an example. If you guys do a yeah. search right now for wedding gifts for the bride, we're either number one or two for that. And then guess wow. what? We'll put the top three spots with the products in our store. And so that actually generates a lot of traffic there. Uh, I'll give you an example, a better example. Uh, let's say you sell fishing equipment like fishing rods and that sort of thing sure. or shirts. You just need to put out content that attracts fishermen and then you can just sell anything in that area, right? You don't have to be constantly posting on social media. Now, granted, I think social media works. It's just yes, not the hamster does. wheel that I want to, it's not the treadmill that I want to get on. This, yeah, this is the point that I'm trying to excavate here is like, there's so many people that struggle to make that leap that you're able to very clearly define, which is, you know, the fishing one is another example. Like what do fishermen like? And you can say, Oh, they like, and we're going to be very stereotypical here. They like boats. They like water. They like water reviews. They like bourbon. They like flannel. I mean, obviously I'm stereotyping, but is, and in, in understanding that, do you then, how do you then constrain the amount of effort or, or rather maximize your leverage? Are you looking at different platforms? Uh, is social media like required for every person who's in business? I definitely don't think it's required. And again, it's, it's all about leverage, right? I would rather yeah. put out one piece of content and have it generate me traffic for years and leads, right? Mm -hmm. I think this book that I'm doing will be the same way. People will find the book naturally on Amazon through search, for example, mm -hmm. read my story and come to me. People are finding my YouTube videos, like I said, that I filmed three years ago. Social media is just short-lived, short, short -lived, right? I've had some things go viral on social before, but it sure. lasts maybe two or three days at most. Yeah. And then I got to post again. Yeah. Interesting. So without going too deep again i want people to get the book and pay attention to your other other channels but if you're listening right now the takeaway from the section is that the hamster wheel is a is by it's not a bug it's a feature that these companies have embedded into their products specifically to get you to be a part of that hamster wheel and what i'm hearing steve said and what there's a, a little bit about this in the book and what he has articulated very clearly here is that through being smart, through understanding your customer and making a decision that you don't want to do that, there are paths through this predicament that can get you the results you want with the lifestyle that you want. And is that a fair statement? It is. Uh, the second okay. part to that is you absolutely need to get your customer's contact information. So mm -hmm. my primary ways are email, SMS, uh, push, and messenger um, right now. Because that's really the only way that you can build a brand. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a brand, really? A brand is just a reputation. And the only way to develop a reputation is with repeated exposure to what you put out. And again, this is where content comes in again. Yeah. So. So. I interrupted you to go a little bit deeper. I asked you to put a pin in that thought so that we could talk about social media for a second because I think it's a trap. And if you go back to the opening salvo here, most people start a business seeking freedom but end up in a prison of their own making. So you you started off on social media and you said, I manage my time carefully there and I seek leverage. But you had a couple of other things you were going to dive into. Let's keep going down that, down that path. Yeah. Yeah. Um... We're talking about like the entrepreneurship trap more along Yeah, the okay. trap. Yeah. Here's the other thing. 
that I've seen, I've been in a number of mastermind groups. And another trap <clears throat> that I see is people just chasing revenue, kind of like how I did early on with my business. For some reason, mm -hmm. I wanted to hit seven figures at one point. And I just went all out to try to hit that number, mm -hmm. sacrificing a lot of stuff in the process. So uh, I've, I've had guys in mastermind groups that really wanted to hit seven figures as well. In fact, there was this one guy who I'm not going to name, but he was doing a good solid mid six figure profit with his business. And he really wanted to hit seven figures in revenue, mainly probably because all the other guys in the mastermind group were, were hitting those numbers. And so he busted his butt. He expanded his team like almost two X and he hit his seven figure goal. But when he looked at his profit, he actually ended up making less money than he did before. Meanwhile, he was working a lot harder and he had people under him now, which was causing additional stress. That's another trap, just chasing revenue, not profit. Mm. I have another, I have a whole bunch of examples uh, in e-commerce that just kind of rub me always the wrong way. You, you know, like Black Friday, people are always yeah. discounting just because everyone else is discounting. Yeah. But if you do the math, Discounting actually hurts a lot. Let me let me just throw some numbers out here. Usually I don't do public math, but let's try here. <laughs> <laughs> let's say you sell a widget for 100 bucks and your margins are 50 bucks. So you're making $50 per sale. Okay? Let's say in a typical day you sell 100 units. So you're making $5,000 a day. Black Friday rolls around and you're like, "Oh, you know what? Um I want to give like a big discount." Let's give 25% off. It's a reasonable discount that you'd see on Black Friday, right? So all of a sure. sudden, you're making $75 now. Still costs you 50 bucks to produce the product. So you're making $25 per sale now. And lo and behold, to make that same $5,000 in profit that you were making before, you now need to sell double, right? So think about it this yeah. way, a, a, an innocuous 25% discount, all of a sudden you, may, you need to make double the amount of sales just to break even. And most people don't do that math. So that's why yeah. I'm not huge on discounting. You remember Bed mm -hmm. Bath & Beyond with their 20% coupons? Those guys yeah. are bankrupt now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, and also discounting sort of cheapens the brand. It does. Right? Yeah. All right. I don't want to lose the thread because what we're here to talk about, I think this, these e-commerce lessons are very valuable because what they are about, let's, let's keep this, let's be very specific here. These are about how to maintain either create, keep, or maintain leverage so that you can have a life you love. And this takes many forms. You're talking about the e-commerce world, but the same is true whether you're a photographer, a painter, a contractor, a data scientist, a freelance, you know, lawnmower. Yeah. I don't know if those are, I don't know if those lot, two words go to Well, go no, together. I mean, you have to quantify your time, right? <laughs> yeah. Everything has a and cost. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and so this, what we're, what we're talking about now is this trap and the trap and and how to avoid the trap is by seeking leverage. <clears throat> so you have some of these principles throughout your book about how to create the leverage and how to stay out of the trap. Let's focus on that for the next sure. you know, 10 or 15 minutes here. Okay, so I already mentioned email and SMS. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the best people that you can leverage because once you have their contact information, you can mm -hmm. sell to them over and over and over again. I think a, a trap that most people fall into in, in any business is constantly going after new customers and not focusing enough on their existing ones. Let mm -hmm. me just throw out some numbers from my business. We're in the wedding industry. You would think that we don't get much repeat business, right? <laughs> I, I know the divorce rate's pretty high in the US, right? But still, yeah. uh, you know, they're not going to come back. So only 12% of our business is actually repeat. But that 12% actually generates 36% of our annual revenue. And the reason why is because we're getting a lot of people to buy again. And we're being very deliberate about it. And we, we, just, we were just talking about leverage, right? Mm -hmm. So what we found, and I, I, did the, I do this exercise every, every uh, three months or so. I go down our customer list, and I look for people that are buying an abnormal amount of linens. So if someone buys like 40 dozen napkins from us, that's not a normal person. 
<laughs> so I pick up the phone and I call them and I say, hey, we noticed you purchased 40 dozen napkins. What do you need them for? What do you do? And more often than not, they'll tell me that they're a wedding planner or an event planner. And then I say, okay, great. Here's a coupon code. Here's a dedicated rep. If you want anything, this person will handle all of your orders and make sure it gets delivered on time. And here's a discount code. And then all of a sudden, they're a customer for life. They buy often and they buy in bulk. And those are the customers that we focus on. Here are just some other stats from our store. If you look, our average order value is 60 bucks in our store. Now, only the majority of our customers, I, I can't remember the numbers, like 46% of our customers actually spend less than half of our average order value. Whereas the customers who spend double our average order value or 120 bucks or more, is only 10% of our business. But that 10% actually represents 50% of our revenue. So you got to look at your business and the customers that you have, and you got to think to yourself, hey, which ones should I be focusing on? Should I be yeah. focusing on these little guys who aren't spending that much money, but represent most of our transactions? Or should I be focusing on our big customers? And the answer is obvious. You only have a little bit amount of time, so you got to focus on the bigger players that will make you more money. Uh, if you want to go a level deeper than that, Chase, like, yeah, go ahead. We look at our traffic sources and we notice that our Facebook customers are the ones that are making us the least amount of money, like the, the, the smaller guys who spend less. Yep. Or is our Google guys, come, people come and finding us through search, spend more money. So again, we focus more on Google. So this is, again, if you zoom out to the, 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 the maxim that you have established here through your life, and in your book that the the principle is you can manage these things you got the four burner theory you don't want to have to divide up your time you want to get good at simmering your business or at at putting the right amount of time so sort of step one is deciding like what do you need to be successful like our friend Ramit right he's like cool how much you know, more is not the right answer. What do you need to live and thrive and be successful and happy and put enough in the 401k or into the savings or whatever it is. And then you're starting to then build a life that will create those things for you. Most people then turn to entrepreneurship or a lot of people turn to entrepreneurship, which is the focus of today's conversation. And let's just, we're using the example here for of you around an e-commerce example. There are other examples, whether you're a photographer, you're shooting weddings, or you're a designer, it doesn't matter. And the punchline of this last bit here is you're like, the way to create leverage is through understanding the details of your business. A lot of people are now saying, oh, gosh, well, I don't want to do that because, you know, I'm just the creative one and my solution is always to make more money. This is part of the trap that you identified very on, early on in your own experience and the in in the book, you de define it. So we, we're talking here in this e-commerce part of the conversation around how do we, there are areas of leverage. All customers, for example, are not equal. All referrals are not equal. All, you know, is, is this fundamentally the way that you feel like having lived this life yourself? Is it really about just understanding the fundamentals of business and asking better questions? Or is there a larger aperture about avoiding this trap that so many entrepreneurs and specifically people who are listening to this show right now fall into? I mean, there's just a finite amount of time. So you got to <laughs> figure out where to spend it. And I know a lot of your listeners are creatives. I'm a creative myself. Yes. And in my case, with content, I need to look at the platforms that will give me the biggest bang for the buck. And I found that YouTube and blogging has been that path. Podcasting to a lesser extent, I use podcasting in a different way. But if I were to do social media once again, that would take a lot of my time and for maybe for, for less bang for the buck. So it applies to any type of business, really. Over the course of a decade, you have created multiple seven-figure businesses. And you've done so with what you articulate as 
say roughly 20 hours a week. And right now there is someone going like, okay, again, I'm, I'm listening. Steve has done it not just once, but he's done it multiple times. And 20 hours a week sounds like it's to most entrepreneurs who are listening right now, that sounds unfathomable. So is there some framework that you can give us around discipline? Like, are you, is there a, are you coordinating time? Like I'm most efficient in the morning or I do this after the kids go, go to bed or, you know, how are you treating these things? Because this seems so elusive to so many people, multiple seven figure businesses while working 20 hours a week. So just to be clear, uh, it didn't start out that way. It's the way it is now, but it was a gradual process for anyone listening out there. It doesn't happen overnight. Got it. So for me, it's all about processes and automation. So I just happen to have an engineering background. So when Mm -hmm. I can, I always have computers solve the problem for me. And we just happen to be living in a fantastic period right now with AI. Uh, Recently, I've actually decided to not uh, to let go of some of my writers because ChatGPT actually does a better job than a lot of them. And I have like an, an editor in the U.S. help with the writing. Here's just some basic philosophies that I always live by. I don't hire anything out unless I know how to do the job myself. Uh, a trap that I've seen with a bunch of friends has been to just hire everything out that you don't know anything about. And what ends up happening is you don't know whether the work that you're getting back is good or not unless you know like the ropes. I actually don't like employees. I'm almost anti-employee. Like when I was a director, I had a lot of people under me and they were they did great work. But what most people don't realize, and it's really glamorous to say you have a large team, but there's a lot of overhead involved, mental overhead of making sure people are happy, people leave and that sort of thing. So I try to keep employees to an absolute minimum. So one of the seven figure businesses that I run, I literally only have one VA in the Philippines. And the way I did it is I just- VA is virtual assistant assistant for people out there. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And and when I hired her, she actually didn't know anything about what I did, podcast editing, video editing, that sort of thing. So anytime I do something myself, and I always start out doing everything myself, it's painful, but I think it's important to learn. What I do is I just, I open up Camtasia or Loom, which is a tool that allows you to record your screen. And I just film myself doing the task myself. And I keep that in a repository. And what I did is I just handed those over to my VA and she just learned what I did over time by just watching me do it. And then as soon as she became comfortable with it, I literally just outsourced all that work to her. And then I moved on to something else. I generally don't outsource anything once again, unless I have pretty good knowledge about it. Interesting. This is a very popular debate because right now there's someone who's like, I don't like selling or... You know, I I don't know how to buy ads on Instagram or I don't know how, you know, and this idea that you have to become a master is where people fall down because it's not, we're not talking about mastery here. We're talking about proficiency. Right. And if there is someone who's better, I'll, I'll use my taxes as an example to side with Steve early on. I didn't know shit about taxes and I decided, well, I'm, too poor to pay somebody else to do it. I therefore have to do it myself. I'm going to, I sat down and in one week, I spent 50 hours learning everything I could about tax code, watching, and this was before, this was like Google video. There was no such thing as YouTube. This is very, very early internet. I was reading. I literally went to the University of Washington library here in Seattle and checked out books on doing taxes. It was the worst work ever, but I spent an entire week and I was able to file my own taxes. I knew just enough about what kind of corporation or what kind of, when I wasn't a, was I a sole proprietor? Was I I understood just enough to get the thing done. And then I recognized I do not want to do this again. So how much I started looking at how much does it cost to someone else do your taxes? Remember, I got 364 days now to figure this out. I did that work. I learned enough to become dangerous and actually to ask reasonable questions for the people that I did ultimately hire. And when Steve is now like suggesting you do the same thing, 
I would ask if you are listening to the show right now that you say, what are the things in my life that I could get proficient enough at such that I could decide whether to hire them out or not? Because here's the alternative. You don't know shit. So you hire someone, you don't know how much to pay them. You don't know if their rates are the right rates. You don't know if they're any good at their business or if they're saving you time or money because managing somebody who sucks actually takes more time and energy and money than not. So is it, am, am, is it fair to say that this is a reasonable um, alignment with why you do this work? Because it doesn't sound fun to a lot of people right now. I mean, learning is fun. I have a great example. You mentioned you taxes. Go. Beautiful. Whenever yeah. I evaluate a new tax attorney, I do the taxes myself and I align the, the taxes side by side with what they got. So I remember the first two accounts we had, they missed a couple of deductions. They were out. And the one that we ultimately hired actually found an, a deduction that I didn't know about. I was like, okay, you guys are the ones. So absolutely. Uh, here's the most egregious example. I had a student in my course who didn't know anything about SEO and they didn't want to watch the videos for some, you know, they just wanted the easy button. So they hired an SEO consultant and that SEO consultant actually destroyed their site by building a bunch of bad links and that sort of thing. And so she came back to me and she said, Hey Steve, you know, my site is not working. I was like, you can't outsource SEO unless you know a little bit about it. So just at least watch like the first three videos so you can actually understand what they're trying to do. And then you'll know what's good and what's bad. It's this, there is a base modicum. The punchline to this is there's a base modicum of knowledge that you have to have as an entrepreneur. Now we see these glorified stories on the internet about, you know, John or Sally who doesn't just wants to do their thing and they outsource everything and they, I just want to play music, man. And, and the reality is that those people do not end up being the people that create the success that most people who are listening to the show right now want to experience and experience. And that success by success, I do not mean tons of money. I mean, living life on your terms, deciding what your rich life is, deciding how much time you want to spend to get back to the punchline of your book, you know, with your family, with the things that are most important to you. These are outlier stories that we have built our lives chasing, and we're building those lives on, frankly, a pack, or a, 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 a pile of crap. What Steve's talking about here is a, is a point of view that when you actually dig in, to the entrepreneurs that are repeatedly successful, they have systems, right? They have um, a framework through which to make decisions. Is this costing me more money or eating more of my time? And this is what Steve is actually preaching if you sort of peel away the layers. Now, what I have to cut to the chase on this. So the book, again, highly recommended, The Family First Entrepreneur. The book is divided into two sections, right? The, the starting part and then sustaining. I think it's brilliant to divide these two things up right now because they're, again, they're, if I'm going to the lister, they are either in, they're usually in one of these two camps, right? It's either I, I have this passion or an interest to change my lifestyle such that I can have more time with my life, my life and my wife and my family, which is the starting bucket or the other one, which is the sustaining bucket. I, I'm, I, I'm in this. I need to get better at it. Let's not talk to the people who are going from zero to one. Let's not talk about starting. There's a lot. We, we've talked a lot about the, on this show about starting. Let's talk about sustaining. The first chapter in your book on sustaining is about systems, workflows, and automations. We tipped, you know, we, we tipped our hat to it. We said, you, as an as an engineer, you like to automate as much stuff. But let's talk about systems. How should people think about systems? I mean, really, what a system is is just a method for doing the boring stuff in an efficient manner. Let me give you an example of a system that we put in a couple of years ago. Uh, once again, these are all <clears throat> e-commerce examples, but they apply to any business. 
there's uh, we do personalization with our linens where a bride and groom can embroider their their name and their wedding date on there yeah. and every morning someone would have to just literally cut and paste from the website to this tool that would generate something the sewing machine could understand and then send it off to the machine and that took about four hours every morning and I was like, this is a boring, repetitive task. This is, we're talking about cutting and pasting from the order. From the order know, from page, yeah. Order page to the manufacturing page. To to this, cut, paste, to cut, the cut, software paste. that night, the machine understands. Sure. Every night there's 40 orders that come in and you've got to cut and paste 40 things or whatever. Okay. Yeah, a human has to cut and paste something from one place to another. Stupid work, right? There must be a better way to do that. And so I just did some research and, and by the way, most people don't even bother doing the research. Everything can be automated. Everything can have a system in place. And I was pleasantly surprised to find out that there's actually software that will literally mimic a human, tell it to click here, cut and paste, and move there. And so I installed that software. Every morning, you just hit a button now, and it does all of that. And we literally saved half an employee's day by doing that. I already talked about the systems in place where if you're doing something, just record yourself doing it. Or if you have an employee doing something, have them document it in an SOP. I hate writing SOPs. Most people do. But so just have an employee do it. If they're already doing it, it's actually not that much extra time to just document what they're doing. And then lo and behold, you'll build up this database of procedures so that if anyone new comes in or someone leaves, you can just point them at this database. Right now, the so NASA is the technical director of the show. She's listening in the background and she helped us, you know, set up our technology today. But I think she's probably like cheering right now. She's, you know, pumping her fist quietly in the <laughs> air. She's are you back there, NASA, appreciating what Steve's saying? Oh yeah. I'm ear to ear grinning right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, this is these are hallmarks of getting your time back, right? This is this is exactly if you want to be spending more time with your family or other things that are important to you, this is like there are ways to automate parts of your business. There are ways to create systems as an example that, you know, Steve just gave. There are dozens of examples that you could easily uncover in every business. And if I'm asked to help a friend with the business, I automatically look at like, what are the crappy customers? Let's cross them off. Where are your highest value customers? Let's double down on those. Where, where, where don't you have a system? Oh, every day you're doing this cutting and pasting thing. Let's search how to fix the dumb, stupid, repetitive things that are, you know, basically eating up all of your time. Is this fundamental principle? Is it systemic in nature? How you got your seven figure business down to something you were able to manage in 20 hours? Or are there other secrets? I mean, that's basically it. Leverage and automation is a lot of it. And, and I just want to be clear. If anyone listening here wants to start like the next $100 million business, like the next Amazon or Facebook, this system isn't really for you. Uh, yeah. But what I found after interviewing 450 entrepreneurs who are successful or just people in my class, most people just want to make enough money to not have to worry about money. Like they're not out to make, you know, hundred million dollars. And my philosophy is if all you want to do is make a couple of million dollars, you can do so with very few employees and working less than 40 hours a week, let's just say easily. And if you get things down really efficient, you can get it down even further. So if I'm digging into the book, the couple of other chapter names, just to make sure that we're touching on the cornerstones of your philosophy. Um, one chapter is called retent. And again, we're in the sustaining part. So this is not people who are going from, Hey, I have an idea to, I want to start a business, which I think I'll leave that, leave the, let the book do the work there, um, for people. And we're focused on people who are already, you know, working in a business that they are trying to grow or to trying to sustain so that they can have the living and life that they love. You were doubling down on finding your most important customers and serving them because they are going to pay more with less hassle. And 
in a photography example here, I would say that that equals like I have said on the internet that I have sold the same photograph for $500 as I have for $50,000. And the only difference was who I was talking to. Yep. So understanding your customers and where your most valuable customers are. So you talked a lot about that is the technical term there is sort of retention. Like who are your best customers and how can you retain them to become repeat businesses? You also talked about growth being expensive. You gave the example of someone who had a seven figure goal. They hit that seven figure goal but it came at a, a substantial price such that they actually made net, net take home less money. So that lesson there, <clears throat> would you couch that in, you know, growth is expensive or is that really the profit versus sales? Um, which do you think of the, those, those term, like how, how to couch those? Yeah. In this particular case, like the easy button often is to just hire somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mentioned mm -hmm. this before. And whenever I go to events, for example, people always ask me how large my team is. As if that's like a good measure of how how big your business is. And I actually hate that question because I feel actually if you look at the layoffs here right now going on in the Silicon Valley, yeah. like huge teams are getting laid off because they probably don't do anything. So yeah. this is why I'm so strict about hiring. Um in response to your question, I think it's a little bit about a little bit of both, right? You're you're using the easy button, which is hiring people, which is not necessarily the most efficient allocation of your funds. Also, you're not making it, which leads to less profit per sale and just less efficiency with with what's going on. Meanwhile, you're increasing the mental overhead of having to manage your employees as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So couple of other cornerstones in this how to sustain a business and make it work for you rather than you become a slave to your business two other i think keys that i'm seeing that i've sort of flagged these pages not quitting too soon don't give up too soon what do, what do you mean by that i think whenever you're learning something it always takes time to sink in. I remember when I was studying engineering in college, there were some things that I just, I was like, I'm never going to understand this. I'm never going to get this. But then all of a sudden over time for something, like I'll wake up one morning and just understand it. I think that's just the way with business also. Uh, I always think of life and business like playing the lottery. The more people that you meet, the more week, the more work that you do and time you take to learn something, that's just more lottery tickets that you're amassing and increasing your chances for success. So this is why if you give up too soon, you know, who knows, maybe you just haven't amassed enough lottery tickets yet to hit the jackpot. Well, and you just get so much more perspective. This is, you know, there's this undercurrent here, which I think it's important to address, which is, and you've said it twice now, this learning piece, finding out most people are like, ah, I don't, don't want to, I don't want to learn or a lot of people that I know, this is one of the reasons I started creative live is because they didn't learn well in the typical school framework, but understanding how learning, how you learn and then being okay with that, whether that's like, I, I just, uh, I communicate in DMS or actually it's in my text community uh, with, uh, you know, a couple thousand people and one gentleman i've spoken to many times he's like you know i i don't read well so i'm gonna listen to your book again and i'm like great do not lament that you do not read well you could either double down on your weaknesses and try and get 50 percent better at reading or if there's another way to absorb the material that works for you that you're comfortable with and you can get comfortable with by shutting out all the other noise great learn how you learn I, I have just in, you know, the course of an hour here with you, Steve, I understand that you're a doer, that this engine, that you have an engineering background, a mindset, you're making videos, you're storing that, like you value learning and teaching. It's, it seems like it's a core value for you. And you know, a lot about your, the way that you learn, how important is the willingness to learn and get your hands dirty in a business that will support you and your family 
and give you the time that you want, how important is learning and how, how should people think about it and or prioritize it? I mean, everyone needs to get their hands dirty. Uh, you can't really learn how to do something unless you try to do it. Uh, it it's funny. <clears throat> when I was an engineering director, I would interview these people. And on their resumes, they'd be like, hey, I designed such and such. I'm like, oh, that sounds really impressive. So I, I dug deep into those designs that they had in their resume, and I could easily tell who actually did the work and who didn't. Because there's all these little details. Like even if you took every class in the world, there's always something little that's not going to be covered in there that you just need to figure out yourself. And that's why everyone needs to get their hands dirty. Uh, don't think that you can just outsource everything or, or hit that easy button. And the best part, and just in my experience, everything that I learn has been applicable to other businesses. Like I pick up one skill here, it's directly applicable to something else, and it just makes something I do in the future that much easier. And that's why it's so important to be constantly learning stuff. You never know when it's be going to become useful. You actually never yes. even know when someone you meet is going to change your life either. Say more about that. Okay. So I had this friend who was doing really well selling on Amazon. I wasn't on Amazon yet. And I was like, ah, I'm making plenty of money on my own store. I, I don't need to go on Amazon. And so what he did was he just send, started sending me text messages every other week, and he'd show me his income reports. He'd be like, oh, yeah, I made $20,000 this week. Do you want $20,000? Or And he'd just keep doing this every week after week. And he was like, clearly, you don't, I mean, hey, look, I literally spent five hours to do this. And he just kept texting me. And finally, I was like, okay, let me just give this a try. And it, he ended up making me an extra $100,000 that first year when I started selling on Amazon. I have lots of stories just like this. Um, we were talking about getting opinions from friends. Uh, mm -hmm. This particular set of friends are very brutal with their feedback. So I, I asked for feedback on my website. And I was like, oh, yeah, just be brutal. And in the back of my mind, I was like, hey, this website looks great. I'm all good, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they ripped it apart. And this is my e-commerce store. And one of the guys said, hey, you teach a class on this stuff. If I saw your website, I wouldn't be taking your class. And so Oof. that statement, I immediately just got the website redesigned right away. It took me seven weeks. But after the seven weeks were over, my conversion rate went up 42% just from that. And so just all these people who are willing to tell it to me straight, people who have just opened me to more opportunities. Jeff Goins introduced us, Chase, and I'm sure we're probably going to have some, we'll probably cross paths again for sure. Of course, yeah. of course. So if on, on this point, there's a balance. And what I would like to hear from you is you design the website, you're advocating doing as much as you can yourself. And at the same time, you recognize that you were not you know, through feedback from others who are maybe a little further along in the game or one piece of the game than you are, whatever that game and business is. In this case, you gave the example of website design. And then I, I heard that you're like, okay, cool. I had it redesigned, S thinking that you reached out to someone who was further along than you did and said, hey, can you help me with this? And you presumably paid them to do that. And it increased your website conversion 42%. So I don't think these things are at odds because you've said you should do things prior to hiring people so that you know what it is you're in for. But how do you know the question that someone's asking right now in their mind as they're, you know, in the middle of their commute is like, okay, help me reconcile this, Steve. How did you know that it was time to get out of your own way and hire an expert? Sure, you can ask some tough questions and you can, you know, a little bit how much you're willing to pay or you've got a friend circle, this mastermind group that can tell you what you should expect or our peers. How do you decide when you do outsource something? Yeah. So in this case, I needed something up pretty quickly because I was hurting like after that, after that mastermind meeting, like there's so much anguish in my head. Like, uh, you know, I need to get this done quickly. And I already designed the first website myself, and I already knew the fundamentals of website design. 
So when I had my designer, I would just check up on him. I wasn't doing like the heavy lifting, but I would look at the code and just make sure that everything was done in such a fashion that it was maintainable and that sort of thing. So and that 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 is what you had discovered through the learning process that you went through prior to hiring. That is correct. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So the analog of that for taxes is you did your own. You looked at the tax work that it made sense to you, and it was better than the work that you could have done. The taxes, the tax person, your accountant saved you more money than you could have saved if you did them yourself. Probably did them faster, more accurate. You have another person to rely on if you get audited by the government. Again, extending that analogy back to the website, this person did it in a way that you could understand the code. You knew just enough to be dangerous and to ask the right questions. So is did you come to that point because you had a set of peers? Or and I'm where I'm getting at here is you've said that you don't like employees. I think that there's a lot of value in that people overvalue having a team to do a bunch of stuff. But when you look at the PL at the end of the day, this it ends up costing you a lot of money. So what role does community play? You've talked about being a member of masterminds. You got this feedback about, you know, changing your site, which improved 42% after you got that feedback and you hired a person. Where do you, you know, where do you, Steve, draw the line or where are our listeners, how ought they think about this balance of I need people, but not too many people. I need some people around me, but not the wrong people. How do you articulate yeah. you know, these decisions? Uh, so in your question, there's just two different types of people, right? Like I, obviously people in my mastermind group are, are not employees. So there's just two different camps. I feel like it's very important to have peers that are doing things that are similar to you because I feel like entrepreneurship is a very lonely process. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't have people that you can bounce ideas off of, it can feel very limiting. And every time I meet with my guys and, and gals, I always learn something new that they're working on because there's millions of different ways to, to approach things. Mm -hmm. And having a group of people to talk to really just keeps your mind open. And I, I mean, to be frank, I probably wouldn't be able to get to where I was today without the community of people that I belong to. And this is why I firmly believe that you should try to hit an event or two every single year so that you can meet people all congregated in the same place doing the things that you do. That's actually the number one reason I decided to launch my own event for that reason. Mm. Mm. Say more. So let's, let's, I would like to do a little bit of a tour. We're talking specifically, you know, a lot of the conversation today is based on your new book, which is called the family first entrepreneur, how to achieve financial freedom without sacrificing what matters most. And, you know, there is a lot there. We've talked mostly about that second half, the, not the one to 10 rather than the zero to one. But again, highly, highly recommend it. I've got an advanced copy sitting in front of me here, which is excellent. Uh, and you have a bunch of other things that we haven't really dove into. You've got a, a great podcast and you talked about, you know, this, the mastermind stuff that you're a part of, but you also talked about this event that you do uh, every year. So I'm wondering, can you shed a little light on sure. these other two applications of your time and effort so people might learn more or actually be able to get some more mm -hmm. juice out of the same lemon that we're squeezing here. This We need to get more juice out of this family first entrepreneur stuff. Yeah. All right. So the event, uh, what was funny is the, the, one of the reasons I started it was because I wanted to be a keynote speaker. It's kind of my bucket list. No one asked me, Chase. So I was like, uh, I'm going to start my own event and, and nominate myself as the keynote. Uh, <laughs> That's one way to do it. <laughs> uh, joking aside, though, I, I just I, I went to a lot of events and I, I always find things at the different events that I go to that I like and dislike. I hate large events. So I just want a nice small event where it, it starts out with like a mastermind group. So an intimate group of like 10 to 12 people. We lock ourselves in the room and cater in food. And we just help each other with our businesses, hot seat style. And I wanted a, a conference just kind of focused on networking. So at my event, everyone eats together. Everyone goes to the same event every single night. And we limit ticket sales to about 200 people. And by the end of the event, you pretty much know everybody. And you have a chance to interact with everybody. And that's the event that I like going to. So that's why I created it. What's it called? 
how to, if people want to attend, where would, where would you direct? Yeah, them? it's called the Seller Summit. Uh, tickets are already sold out for this year, but it's typically in May every year, and it's targeted towards e-commerce folks. Uh, we actually do screen for revenue also just to ensure that you know the guy next to you you know is doing pretty well. Uh, Got it. Say more about masterminds. Um, yeah. You know, this is something that uh, is – it's not known until you know about it and then you see it everywhere. It's sort of like if you buy a Volkswagen bug, right? You don't, you don't recognize it and then you're like, oh, these things are everywhere. So say more, you've just given a little bit of a, a brief overview there uh, and you use the phrase hot seat, to, but help people understand. And I'm doing this mostly because there are so many resources out there that a lot of entrepreneurs don't. We're pointing to your book as one you know, you, you mentioned the mastermind that you're a part of, you essentially have your own in the form of this other, this event, but help people understand a little bit more about what is that? I mean, at a fundamental level, a mastermind group is really just a group of people that meet on a regular basis to hold each other accountable and help each other with their businesses. And really the best way to find a mastermind group is to physically meet someone in person at an event. Every single member of any mastermind that I've ever been in for the most part, has been with people that I met in person. You hit it off and you actually like that person. You want to interact with them. And uh, you just you just arrange something, really. That's all it is. Yeah. It can Usually be- Usually a- there's a, yeah, there's a often hosts, right? People mm-hmm. host, like, this is something that I will, I've been working on for 10 years and I will put out into the world here in the not too distant future. But the point here is that there's often a point person who is the organizer of the mastermind. There's a fee that you pay that f- that fee facilitates great speakers, meals, get togethers, the, the event accoutrement. Um, what else could you say about it besides what you opened with and what I just added there? Yeah. Um, so there's that, what you just described. And then there's just kind of different formats for it. And I've been mm-hmm. in a do- number of different mastermind groups. Sometimes what you can do is you go around the table and you talk about something that's working for you in your business. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. you go around hot seat style and you share like a problem that you're having. And hopefully the other members, you know, can, uh, can help you with that problem. The other style of mastermind group that I've been a part of also has been just kind of like a free for all, like the topic for that particular meeting is let's just say it's AI. And then we have like this little round table that just kind of discusses how they're, how everyone's using it, uh, what we foresee in the future, what the trends are and that sort of thing. A bunch of different ways that you can run it. Got it. So it's to me, I'd like to now wrap up by going back to the book because the book, um, again, it is absolutely, I would say critical reading if, you're finding that you are you have a, a business that you started because you want freedom and now you are you are in a sense enslaved if if this describes at all your experience got to check out the family first entrepreneur the end of the family first entrepreneur says making the most of your time and freedom So I'm hoping you can put a nice um, bow on our conversation today, which how do we make the most of the time and freedom that we expect to get from all of these, these principles and lessons about leverage and about learning and whatnot that we've walked through today? So fundamentally, it's about figuring out what makes you happy, right? I'll just describe what makes me happy. I'm not a complicated person. Like if I can have lunch with my wife once or twice a week, if I can go on walks with the kids, if I can play tennis and ultimate and lift weights in a given week, that's a great week for me. That's what is enough to make me happy. Like I don't need fancy cars. I don't, I don't need like trinkets or gadgets or anything like that. That's what makes me happy. Spending time really with the family. Uh, I, I hit all of my kids games, uh, what my wife does today is she runs the entrepreneurship program at my daughter's school. So my kids, uh, when they were 9-11, they started their own business selling uh, print-on-demand T-shirts uh, for kids, entrepreneurship T-shirts for kids. And my daughter has caught the bug. She's on her second store right now where she's selling her own handmade jewelry. And we're actually working on – she's working on a class right now, a course. 
meant for teenagers on how to start their own businesses from the perspective of someone who has a very low budget to get started. Mm. And so that's, I mean, it's, it's really a, a question you have to ask yourself. Like, how do you want to be spending your time? What do you enjoy doing? For some people that might be playing golf. For some people that might be not hanging out with family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who knows, you know? Just got to figure out what makes you happy. Awesome. And there are some very helpful guidelines in chapter 14 of the book uh, about, you know, what what questions should you ask yourself to find out what you truly love and want to do with the time? Because again, it's sort of like how much money is enough? You know, how much time is enough? I knew someone who created so many systems that they just had unlimited freedom and yet they found themselves. He tells me this great story. His name is Milo. He tells me this great story about he was jet skiing in the middle of a lake watching it's like 7 45 in the morning watching all of the traffic commuting and suddenly longed to commute to a job so he would have something to do <laughs> and what that yeah crazy right but what that is this is a sad and twisted story but what that is is that is a recognition of someone who hasn't sort of quieted down enough to realize what they really want and the idea of I want a seven figure business that I don't have to run. Okay, maybe that's what you wanted then. And as soon as you get that, like then what's next? And there's not really a core set of principles and values that are governing the why, the bigger why to your life. And I've, I found chapter 14 really interesting. Again, making the most of your time and freedom has very much to do with what are your values? What, if, what do you want to do with this one precious life? Which is a cornerstone of the show. And it seems like a reasonable place to wrap up. Steve, very, very grateful for your time. We've pointed people at a couple different things. You're, you know, you haven't talked enough about the podcast yet. You got a podcast, obviously the book. Um, where would you point folks who are interested to learn more? Because this has been yeah very valuable, but I know people understand this is the tip of the iceberg with you. Yeah, you can find more about the book over at thefamilyfirstentrepreneur.com. And I'm giving away a bunch of bonuses. Uh, there's a three-day workshop on how to get started with e-commerce. There's a two-day workshop on how to make money with a blog, a podcast, or YouTube, which are things that I do. And I'm also giving a six-week, what I call a family-first challenge in June, where I'm going to be in a private Facebook group and help you figure out what your side hustle is or help you get out of your rut, whatever that may be. So that's over at thefamilyfirstentrepreneur.com. And uh, you mentioned the podcast. Uh, I actually launched the podcast just to meet other people because uh, I wasn't getting out enough at one point because I had kids and I couldn't travel. So having hour-long conversations with people is is amazing. So I have amazing people on the show over at, uh, it's called the My Wife Quitter Job podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Awesome. Thank you very much for being a guest in the show for uh, congratulations on your new work uh, in the format of a book. You've done so much and thank you for being very tactical. We have so many conceptual guests on the show that help people think big and what your work is very practical in. And I love that it's action oriented. I've been an advocate of action over intellect for a long time. I mean, not to denigrate intellect, but so many of us try and solve our problems from the couch rather than getting out there, getting our hands dirty, as you said a couple of times throughout the show. So thank you for championing that and for just being a lovely, kind, smart soul out in the world. We really appreciate you and your work and wish you a ton of success on everything, but specifically the new book. Thank you so much, Chase. Appreciate cool. it. Cool. Until next time, uh, from Steve and myself, yours truly here at uh, Chase Jarrett's live show. Until next time, we both bid you adieu.